Okay, so I get to talk about technical considerations for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. There's been an evolution in reverse shoulder arthroplasty over the last couple of decades, starting from a Grammont prosthesis with a 155 to um, having fi designs with better fixation, the, the, you know, the Delta one here, and then uh, now more lateralized 135 designs. And I was asked to talk about uh, technical considerations for irreparable tears, and I think <clears throat> what this really gets at is the needs have changed. Right in, in the 1990s, and when the reverse was introduced in the early 2000s in the U.S., the need at that time was restore forward flexion, patients with an irreparable cuff tear. It was used primarily as older patients as salvage procedure, and what's happened in 2019, we have expanded indications. We're using this for primary arthritis, uh, revision cases, and then irreparable tears in younger patients, and that's really where these patients have greater functional demands, and we need to think more and more about longevity. And so, you know, Rob said we want to use this in older patients, and that's true, but oftentimes, you know, you do not have another solution in reverse is what you have to rely on. So, um, the Arthrex design, you know, from a humeral side, there's a 135 or a 155 degree inclination. It's an inlay cup, and it's a press fit prosthesis. I will tell you, though, the 135, 155 thing, 95% of people who use this design use it because of 135, and I'll get into why that is. And now there's a short stem option available, the, the Apex Reverse Shoulder Arthroplasty with uh, size sixes and up. This has been out for a little over a year now. We've looked at the, the results and made sure we haven't seen any problems with uh, fixation. And I use this as my go-to in most of my patients unless they're um, over the age of 80 and I'll go with a standard length stem. On the glenoid side, the MGS base plate offers 24 and 28 millimeter base plates in increments of lateralization of zero, two, or four millimeters. And then there's a screw or post. So when you combine that base plate with the glenosphere sizes, which are available in these four sizes, there's offset in the glenosphere or a neutral or four lateralized. So essentially because of that, those differences, you can go lateral in two millimeter increments from zero up to eight millimeters. So let's get into why the, what's the philosophy of that design. So the Grammont prosthesis, um, classically was described as medializing the arm and lengthening the arm. And um, as you can see in this force diagram here, this led to some consequences. So the re early results when this was published in 2007, 191 reverse shoulder arthroplasties, you can see that the patients here did excellent in forward elevation, but they lacked internal and external rotation, as you can see here, right? And so this is your classic patient. Now with a medialized center of rotation, they could raise their arm overhead, but they can't get out to the side or get behind the back. And one of the problems with this design is that when you follow this out five years, they, they tend to do well functionally um, overall, and rather survival, but their function declines. As you can see here, if you look at the constant score, these patients get worse and worse over time. This is where that seven year kind of timeline became a, 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 what was talked about for many years. One of the main culprits here is scapular notching, almost universal with a Grammont prosthesis because you're right up against the scapula. And when you look long-term, again, the prosthesis stays in most of the time. This is their 10-year study, 93% survival, primarily in older patients. But what happened is the humerus was more likely to loosen over time, probably because poly wear, and their function declined from initial to long-term follow-up. So how do we improve on reverse shoulder arthroplasty? Well, we want to improve the range of motion. We want to get better internal external rotation. We want to decrease notching to maintain function, decrease humor loosening. And then we want to be bone preserving, especially if we're using this in our younger patients. And that really is where you get to the short steps. So I think you've got to take a step back and say, what's the goal of reverse? And Rob nailed it. We used to talk about lengthening the arm and medializing the center rotation, but really I think it's to restore stability to the joint. You know, the rotator cuff, the function is concavity, compression, and balanced force couples. So with the reverse, you think about what you're using for, it's restoring joint stability. If that's the case, then you should put it in the most anatomic spot possible. You should make it a stable joint, but allow all the muscles to work effectively in the remaining spot. And a lateralized inlay design does that best. This is a study from Ruben Gobizi, where he looked at essentially uh, the position of the center rotation in a Grammont prosthesis compared to controls compared to 135. In the 135 lateralized design, there was no difference from controls. So essentially their anatomy was almost the same after the surgery. The other thing about restoring a center of rotation is that there's a big difference between an onlay prosthesis and an inlay prosthesis. So an onlay prosthesis, nobody thought that that was a good idea to start. What happened is that became a way to get around convertibility because people wanted to try to create convertible stems so they, they had a hard time doing that um, in an inlay fashion. 
So you say, okay, well, let's just put the poly tray up top. And then that leads to consequences. You look at the pictures here in the left and the right, you can see that the arm is in a much different position, right? You can see that the arm and the onlay is distalized. And you can see that it's more medialized relative to our lateralized 135 design where you can see the Gothic arch is almost normal. And this leads to consequences. The French have shown that an onlay stem leads to increased risk of scapular spine fracture compared to when they were doing an inlay previously, 4.3% in this study. Alex and I did a study, we, and, and rather than just looking at one design, um, we compared my prosthesis to his and then Mark Frankel's. So we had different prosthesis looking at inlay and onlay. And we went out one year, you see dramatic differences in the risk of scapular spine fracture, 12% with an onlay compared to less than 5% with an inlay. And that doesn't also get at the fact that you have increased risk of neurological injury with, an, with a distalized stem. So now what about notching? How do you decrease notching? I think this is pretty well accepted and understood by everybody, but really go back, goes back to Mark Frankel's study where he showed that the single biggest thing that you can do to decrease notching is to have a more, um, vert or more vertical implant or a 135 type of design. So you see here x-ray on the left, Grammont prosthesis 155. Even with a bio RSA, this patient has notching. Here's a 135, no notching because now we've lateralized or we've gone, we've gone more vertical on the humeral side and away from the glenoid. The other thing you also see here is with this medialized design, you have a flat sort of deltoid, whereas with a 135 design, especially lateralized, you're more likely to have a restoration of the normal contour. What about motion? We talked about internal external rotation. The single biggest thing you can do here is to increase your offset, right? So you can go more lateral. And Mark Frankel's looked at his results five years using a 135 lateralized design, 94% survival, notching now down to 9% in his cohort, much different from what we talked about previously. And look at his patients here. They're getting external rotation compared to the, the patients that weren't getting that with a Grammont prosthesis. So there's a question of lateralization, how much, what's optimal? Because you can go out as far as you want from a mathematical perspective. You can go out to 20 and that's going to be ideal, right? So is it zero? Is it four? Is it eight? The best information we have from this right now is only on computer simulation studies. Uh, there's two studies on this. This is one of those that's published by Jill Walsh. Interestingly, what he concluded here with based on his optimal range of motion findings in this computer simulation was that a 135 with five millimeters of lateralization provided the best results. Another study says it's somewhere between five and 10. So here's a case example, 75 year old gentleman of mine. I went out four because that's all I had available at the time. And you can see one year post-op, he's doing well functionally, but he still has some notch in there. He's got grade one notch and it's occurring in fairly. Now with the MGS system, I can go out even further. I can go out up to eight. I can also use glenosphere to match the patient anatomy, use a 33 if I want to go down for females or you know, go up to a 42 for large males. So that leads to, to a lot of different options. So my guideline for sizing now for glenospheres is when I, I'll first um, take the humeral head cut and I'll base my glenosphere size off the humeral head cut. I'll just look at it. And generally for, for women, it, for me it's a 33 because that size fits best about 80, 20 percentage of the time. Generally for men, it's a 39 is my most common. I use a, a, a 36 a third of the time. And then 40, for about 5% of the time I'll use a 42. And then an offset, what I generally do is I will go out eight millimeters if they're less than 70, because what I'm trying to do is limit notching as much as I can preserve the rotation. If they're a little bit older, I start stepping that down because one of the consequences is the further you go out laterally, you do make the delta work a little bit harder. So I'll, I'll, I'll tend to accept a little bit more medialization there, uh, knowing that I may get a little bit of notching, but I don't want the deltoid to have to work as hard to raise the arm overhead. So that's why I'll go up even, only four with an older patient. Here's an example of a 63-year-old gentleman. He's had three previous surgeries, and at last he had a hemicap. He's a very active retired farmer. You can see his exam here. He's limited in external rotation, forward elevation. He, and he's got subscap failure on his exam. You see I had a positive um, bear hug test. Here are his x-rays. He's got this hemicap in place on his CT scan. It's hard to get a lot of information from a CT scan in a revision case, but you can tell he has subscap atrophy. So you know his subscap's torn based on this in his exam. So I elected to go with the reverse. I didn't feel like I could reconstruct his, you know, his atrophied subscap with a revision anatomic. So I did a reverse, I went out eight millimeters. If you look at his Gothic arch here, it's essentially normal on his x-rays. And then you see, if you look out lateral to the acromion, his humerus is well lateral to that. So I've restored his normal anatomy, 
And this is what you see is that now this patient, he has good external rotation and he has good forward elevation. But I think it's most impressive is that he has now good internal rotation behind his back and with a less lateralized design, I was not able to get this. And that's only at three months. In summary, um, I think the desirable features for longevity and reverse shoulder arthroplasty is you want to be as close to anatomic as possible, so that's a 135 stem. Um, provide offset with lateralized glen glenospheres and base splits. Restore the core with an inlay prosthesis and press fit fixation for bone preservation. Thanks.